the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello. Our very generous and genial host, Mr. Freeman, uh, is not here this evening. I think from now on he's going to leave me to your mercies and I'm going to try to get, take care of myself. If any of you have wandered into the wrong place, I'll even tell you who I am. <laughs> You'll have to forgive one other thing this evening, and that is my voice. I've got the remnants of a cold, and so I'm going to have to uh, conserve my voice a bit. I hope that this mic will carry without my throwing my voice away at, at the whole entire room. If any of you find that I'm not talking loud enough, I wish you'd put your hands up. This course has a double function and quality, and that is that on the one hand, we tried to follow a certain scheme which has been outlined in the little brochure on the Jewish omnibus uh, for the six meetings of the course, uh, which has been mapped out ahead and which deals with a certain sequence of, uh, of topics in the study of American civilization and also uh, in the study of the Jewish subculture within America. And uh, I've asked you to read certain sections of America as a civilization uh, in accord with that outline. But also, uh, I like to make use of whatever some of the principal events are that have taken place since we met in the nation as a whole and in the world outside uh, to make some sort of comment on those events and consider questions from you. And I don't like to give up either one of these functions of the course, although they don't necessarily go along with each other. And what I'm going to have to do it happened uh, the first time that we met last time that the two jibbed pretty well. That is, the big event at that time had to do with the southern bombings, and as it happened, the readings, the outline of the course, had to do with the basic position of minority groups in American life. But that isn't true at the present time. With your permission, what I'm going to do is to spend uh, just a little time at the beginning starting with the larger culture with the nation as a whole and some of the events in the outside world, and then uh, going on to the, uh, uh, to the immediate topics. If that's all right with you. Uh, the big event, of course, was the election results. We haven't had a chance yet in the course itself to discuss uh, the chapter in which I deal with American government and politics, that will come next time. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, with even without that, it's worth saying a few things about the meaning of the election results. May I say, incidentally, that at the end of uh, 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 when, I, when I get through with these preliminary remarks, uh, I'll be glad to have questions on every aspect of anything I mention or a lot of things I don't mention. I want to be very brief in summary on this because there's been a good deal of discussion in the press and elsewhere. There's not very much that I can add to it. I would say that what happened in the election were, had a good deal of meaning. I think it came uh, after two years of a good deal of frustration in the minds of the American people. There had been uh, two presidential elections in which they had made a commitment from which they had expected results. 
there had been uh, an intervening congressional election in 54, so that they had made three, three electoral commitments, particularly the two presidential ones, and they expected results, and I think they felt they had not gotten them. I think that there was a good deal of, uh, uh, of uh, frustration and even rage, uh, which took the form of certain symbols. The, uh, the symbol of Sputnik, which uh, Drew Pearson in an interesting book has recently formulated in terms of the question, has America become a second-class power? The, uh, the, uh, the symbol of the Middle East and the feeling of chaos in foreign policy that the people get from that. The symbol of Little Rock and the feeling of a, a lack of foresight, a lack of planning, and a lack of moral leadership which I think the people got from that. And then finally, the, whether rightly or wrongly, the symbol of, uh, of the recession, the feeling that uh, the pocketbook nerve had been hit. If you take these frustrations, these symbolic frustrations, and if you add to that uh, something linked with it, namely uh, a, a restless uh, search for leadership, a hunger for the leadership not vouchsafed, not given, but that had been expected. Uh, and if you add to both the rage and the hunger a, uh, uh, a general lack of, uh, of quality in a good number of the Republican candidates right across the country, uh, compared with uh, some considerable vigor and youth on the part of some of the Democratic candidates. If you add all this up, of course, you get the tidal wave which swept the country. Uh, but my emphasis is, uh, notice, rather negative. It is not uh, something that the Democrats uh, are necessarily able to deliver, not even anything specifically they promised. It is a sense of disappointment, frustration, anger, a vacuum of leadership, both uh, firm and decisive political leadership abroad and moral leadership at home, and it runs in these terms. And uh, one asks then what follows from these election results. Now, sometimes it is true that a purely negative tide like the present one tied against the outs, may, I mean against the ins, may bring the outs in, and it is conceivable that this will happen in 1960, but not necessarily true. I think a good deal will depend on what happens in the intermediate years, uh, what happens both uh, in events themselves, which uh, will sharpen the symbolic frustration and rage and hunger for leadership or, or change that. And what happens in the quality and stature of the candidates who are presented to the people. And that brings me to one of the rather important questions about American politics, which uh, you will find discussed in some of the readings which I'm going to suggest for you for next our next meeting. And that is that the style and genius of American politics are not abstract. They're not intellectual, they're not ideological. Uh, Americans have a way of belittling the whole political process. They, uh, the word politician does not have standing in, uh, in American prestige, nor does the politician himself have standing in American life. We don't take politics in, in a grand ideological fashion the way the Europeans do. Uh, we pride ourselves on being what we call pragmatic in politics, on having a practical approach to power, on saying, in effect, show results. That means that we don't put as much emphasis on political and ideological labels as uh, Europeans do politically on the European continent, which accounts to a great extent for the degree of, uh, 
for the extent of uh, an independent vote in America, for the tendency to cross over from one party to another. Uh, nevertheless, this ought not to give us the notion that there is uh, no logic in, uh, in American elections and no, what the statisticians call, no secular trend, no trend over a period of time. There very decidedly is. If you study American history, you find grand, grand sweeps, great sweeping arcs, which indicate that the, there must be some kind of ideological tendencies within that period of American history leading the people in a particular direction, that it doesn't entirely depend upon the nature of the candidate or the popularity of a particular man or the style of his personality. Uh, I'm suggesting then that there is a logic and that the quest for this logic in American politics is one of the most difficult things there is. Ordinarily, uh, if you look back, you will find, let us say, that uh, uh, um, starting with the time of Jefferson, you had big cycles. At the time of Jefferson, you had uh, the Virginia dynasty, which was democratic in power for some time. Uh, its power was broken for a spell, and then with Jackson, they returned. Uh, it was broken again, and with the Civil War, the Republicans had a long uh, spell of power, which lasted with very minor interruptions until 1912 with Wilson's first term. The minor interruptions were two terms of Grover Cleveland. You had uh, Wilson in power for uh, eight years, and then you had, you had the Republicans in power for 12 years. Uh, and uh, then the Democrats from 32 to 48 for 16 years. And so one would expect by this uh, large cyclical sweep that there would be some kind of continuance of Republican power longer than the eight years that, that they are in for. I say this is if you look at it in these cyclical terms. But I think that it's blind to think only in terms of cycles because the cycles are the product of rather deep aspirations, movements of thought and feeling and passion within people. And my own hunch is that this particular movement of thought and feeling and passion which found expression in these congressional elections this year is not one that is likely to play itself out. It's not one that has to do just with personalities. There was within the larger tidal sweep a smaller one inside of New York State, which I think did have to do with personalities and a very interesting personality in the form of new, the new governor, Rockefeller. But uh, uh, this is local. It does not represent the national pattern. If Mr. Rockefeller were again to become a candidate, we might have to consider very seriously whether on the national scale he could duplicate what he did on the scale, uh, uh, the state scale in New York. But the likelihood of his being a candidate is one question, and then the likelihood of his being able to duplicate it is another. And notice I'm talking of rather deep-seated causes. I think these deep-seated causes have to do with the reassertion in the minds of many people of, uh, of certain things that they associate with the two parties. That the Democratic Party has thought in terms of, uh, of human rights where the Republicans have thought in terms of property rights. That the Democratic Party has thought in terms of, uh, of people where the Republican Party has thought very largely in terms of entrenched interest. This obviously uh, has exceptions in particular times and with respect to particular people. It doesn't apply to Southern Democrats. It doesn't apply to Republicans like uh, Mr. Stimson, Mr. Hughes, Mr. Wilkie, and so on. But what happens, of course, is uh, in a time of frustration and anger that there is a reassertion of this basic pattern of thinking in the minds of people and this pattern of feeling.
My hunch is that that will continue to be reasserted. The question of candidates is, of course, another matter. My own feeling with respect to the Republicans is that Mr. Nixon, who came out probably uh, with the greatest deflation of his political future of anyone, with the exception of Governor Harriman, and Mr. Nixon, who is still the front runner and still has the support of the Republican National Organization, is going to be in for very considerable trouble. He has tried to refurbish the image of himself in the national mind, notice how quickly, by his very successful visit to London, where once more he played a different role from the role that he played in the 1958 campaign. In the 58 campaign, his role is associated with his exhortation to Republican candidates throughout the country to play on the theme of democratic radicalism, uh, on the theme of uh, Walter Ruther as a, as a dangerous symbol of what the Democrats are driving at, ADA and so on. In, at London, he, uh, uh, his role was a very different one. It was the role of a liberal with world uh, vistas, with uh, an insight into the needs of the uncommitted people of the world and so on. But I would say he's gonna have hard going. And uh, the struggle between him and Mr. Rockefeller is a very real one, no matter how much Mr. Rockefeller may, uh, may refuse to take on the, the, both the burden and opportunity that his present position gives him. With respect to the Democrats, there are uh, a large number of men in the field. Uh, my own feeling is that uh, that the two front runners at the present time are Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Stevenson, and that Mr. Stevenson is not to be discounted, that Mr. Kennedy, despite the fact of being a Catholic, uh, is going to make a very strong race for the nomination, and that if these two should somehow stymie each other, uh, there will then be a tendency to turn to uh, one of the people less discussed at the present time, like perhaps Senator Symington or someone else, uh, but that fundamentally this will be a dilemma for the Democrats because anyone who has not been put forward, who's been holding back in order not to take the risks of being out in front is very unlikely to be the kind of candidate who will be able to meet the responsibilities of 1960 whether Mr. Nixon runs or whether Mr. Rockefeller runs as the Republican candidate, one of the big Republican issues is going to be the issue of civil rights for Negroes. The little rock symbol will come to the forefront as never before. Mr. Nixon has been very carefully building a position on that, and the same would be true of Mr. Rockefeller. No Democrat who is a compromise candidate in the sense that he is acceptable to the South as well as to the North is likely to be able to meet either of those men on that ground. So that my own conclusion is that the Democrats too are in for considerable trouble. They will have to resolve the, their Algeria, you might call it, their Algerian rebellion, which is the rebellion of the Southerners. Fortunately, they're in a position to resolve it because one of the things these, uh, two of the things this election has done for the Democrats has been, one, almost all the new people that have been brought into the governorships and senatorships and congressional seats are young, active, vigorous, and liberal Democrats. Uh, they're not Southern for the most part because the Southerners tend to be the same old faces. They, it's a one-party system and you return the same people, which means uh, that the South, uh, has a new accession of opponents within the Democratic Party. Secondly, uh, this means that the position of the Southerners in Congress is no longer as strong as it was. Washington, you know, has become the last outpost of Southern reaction. That is to say, the position of Southerners in, in the chairmanships, in their entrenched uh, congressional uh, strongholds, uh, that has become the the, the, the last outpost that they're now ready to defend. 
but uh, with the new situation, it may well be that they no longer will be as necessary to the Democratic Party as a whole as they were. In 48, Truman was able to carry the country despite a congressional uh, revolt, and the same is likely to be true in 1960. So much for that. Uh, there remains uh, some issues in foreign affairs which I cannot, which I don't have the time to discuss, but which I can mention in case you have some questions. In foreign policy, it seems to me that the three big events have been the crisis over Berlin, the, the French elections, and the new developments in the Middle East, with perhaps a sentence or two on each to indicate my own position and open up questions you may have. I would say that the crisis in Berlin presents us with the fruits of our do-nothing policy over the past 12 years since the end of the war. George Kennan has complained, and rightly, that uh, as long as we do nothing on the issue of, uh, of what to do about Germany, uh, Berlin remains a source of international crisis and trouble, and he's turned out to be right. Uh, this does not mean that we should give in to the Russian and East German pressure. I think that Berlin has to be saved from the Russians say becoming a free city. Actually, it means becoming swallowed up as an island in the East German Communist Sea. There can be no retreat and no compromise on the question of whether we will yield to pressure or force. I would say, incidentally, that there's no danger that the Russians will start a war over it. Everything that we've learned about their policy recently indicates that they are afraid to use war as an instrument of national policy except where they're trying to save one of their own satellites from revolution, as in the case of uh, Hungary. Uh, that's not the problem. The real problem has to do not with whether we ought to give in on Berlin. We won't. The real problem has to do with what we'll do about it. And here I can only suggest that we will now have to face the issue of getting the Russians to withdraw their troops and withdrawing our own troops from Germany. I am myself not happy over the idea of a unified Germany. The more I study of German history, the more I'm convinced that the unification of Germany under Bismarck in 1870 was a, was a foolish and dangerous thing. It brought together a mass of power before that the, in the units within that mass of power had learned anything about the democratic experience. I would say that it's still true that unification of Germany, real unification of Germany, is not the desirable solution. But some kind of confederation of the two Germanys, an economic confederation, might be. Or some kind of uh, settlement in which the United Nations takes over the guardianship over Berlin to keep it free might also be part of it. The disengagement that Kennan talks of, where both sides would withdraw their troops and the whole area would be neutralized, uh, could be added as a solution to either of these solutions that I'm talking about. I myself am not afraid of disengagement. I do not think that the future of either Europe or America depends upon the maintenance of missile bases, American missile bases, in Germany. And actually, I'm uh, a little concerned myself as to the presence of those missile bases in Germany. Wanting one other comment on Berlin, and that is that the Russians obviously are spurred to doing what they've been doing because they're worried about the exit of so many East Germans through the, through the door of West Berlin, three million of them since the end of the war, which indicates that the way of life in communist East Germany is not what the communists crack it up to be. The Germans who who have been accustomed to privation and to poverty, who have even been accustomed to dictatorship, find this an intolerable way of life. On France, uh, the French elections indicate very interestingly that uh, the importance of the personal symbolism in, even in politics that are supposed to be so ideological as French politics are. The French have always laughed a little at us. In fact, Europeans have laughed in general because our politics are not ideological. They're not the politics of doctrine, but of personality. 
if nothing that has ever happened in America goes as far as the commitment to a single personality, in this case de Gaulle, as these elections indicate. The de Gaulle party ran, the candidates of that party ran on almost no platform except commitment to de Gaulle. And the strange thing about it, of course, is that de Gaulle himself on the crucial issue of Algeria had uh, not indicated where he stood. What this means now is a drastic defeat, not only for the communist left in France, but for the non-communist left as well, almost the wiping out of the left. A certain center still remains, particularly with the MRP and the Catholic Democrats, the Christian Democrats, but even they are not very strong. Mostly what you have now in France, at least so far as Parliament is concerned, is a very top-heavy conservative bloc. Under the leadership of Jacques Soustel, who, uh, who was largely instrumental in the army revolt, who is himself split because he's partly an army man, an arm, a man of the army reactionaries, and partly a de Gaulle man. A good deal depends on what role Soustel is going to have in France, whether, for example, he will claim uh, the role of prime minister, premier. De Gaulle will obviously be president. The premier and the parliament will not have the same importance in the France of the Fifth Republic as they had in the France of the Fourth Republic. And yet this does not mean that they will have no importance. And so France, which uh, had weathered a difficult constitutional crisis with the help of de Gaulle's skill and with the magic of his name, now finds itself confronted by uh, another crisis, this time a double one. The crisis of what to do about a right-wing parliament and leader of the strongest party, and secondly, the problem of what to do about Algeria. The Algerian war continues. De Gaulle has not yet made a commitment about it. My own feeling is that de Gaulle is a man of the left. I know that this may seem strange after the assumptions we've always made that he's a fascist dictator. When I say he's a man of the left, I mean his basic convictions and sympathies are Republican, using Republican now in the French sense, that is going back to the tradition of the French Revolution, that uh, while he has very little use for Parliament, his, uh, he does not want to see a non-parliamentary France that his program for Algeria, so far as I can judge it at any rate, is that of a gradual autonomy so that it will finally govern itself, except for staying within the framework of French foreign policy, eventually perhaps assuming the position that dominions assume and have in the British Commonwealth. On all social issues, he seems to me to believe in uh, in the kind of welfare state that we uh, associate with the New Deal and that the British associate with the Labour Party. And one of the interesting things is to see what will happen with a de Gaulle of this kind, who uh, has uh, a parliament and a dominant party like a millstone around his neck, who uh, were brought in because they used the magic of his name. Uh, so far as the Middle East is concerned, that is one of the most intriguing situations of all. What you have there after the Iraqi revolution is the emergence of a new Middle East leader to challenge the position of Nasser. Uh, I'm talking now General Qasem, who was supposed to be the stooge and instrument of Nasser in that Iraqi revolution, but who now turns out to be not just an independent Iraqi nationalist leader, as I had uh, thought, by the way, as I have thought now for a month or two, but who, according to the latest news, has more in mind than that. He evidently has in mind and challenged to Nasser as the leader of uh, the total Arab population in the Middle East. The news seems to be that he is proposing a new kind of federation, Arab federation in which uh, there will be no uh, submersion of any state within another state, as was true, for example, of Syria within Egypt, in which each Arab state will be allowed its own independence and its own government, but in which, nevertheless, there will be some kind of loose economic federation 
and the Federation with respect to foreign policy. Uh, he is offering a place in this Federation to some of the little uh, uh, sheikdoms which are so rich in oil and which will be able to bring oil revenue into it. And he is even offering to Nasser, to the Egyptians and the Syrians, the chance to come into this Federation on the same basis as the others. And Nasser has not yet broken negotiations on this. I have said uh, many times in writing and in speaking, and I say again that Nasser is no Hitler, but that he bears a very strong resemblance to Mussolini. That there's the same effort to build a fantastic imperial dream on a very rickety base. The rickety base being the rickety economic system of Egypt. Egypt's economy is even worse than it has been for some time. Uh, you don't solve any problems with Russian arms, and you don't solve any economic problems with Russian technicians. You don't solve any problems by these, uh, by these uh, glorious paper victories, diplomatic victories that he has uh, had. Uh, the result is that it may well be that if he finds that he cannot lure any of the Arab states into his own federation, those with oil in them, and if he cannot overthrow them and assassinate their leaders, which he's been trying to do, he may uh, accept some kind of partnership with Qasem and the new federation. Now, all of this is still in the making, but it is uh, interesting to see that uh, the, the monopoly that Nasser was supposed to have over Arab leadership on the basis of the doctrine of pan-Arabism, the doctrine that there are no Arab nation states, no boundaries between Arab nations, that they're all one people, should follow one leader and should be part of a one empire, that that doctrine has been challenged. It's been challenged by uh, a man like Qasem, and there may be others to come along. On the double basis, one, that each Arab state is to have its own nationalism, which I think is very healthy. And second, something that I find more doubtful, but which is probably inevitable, and that is that these Arab states are very likely to be tied together in some kind of federation. But the real question is whether this will be a genuine federation with equality for all, or whether it'll be an empire. It's going to be interesting to see how that develops. I don't think Nasser is going to allow these events to take place without making a real fight. The fratricidal conflict between Arab brother states, which has been so bloody a feature of recent Middle East politics, is likely to continue. And we're going to be very lucky if one of those conflicts doesn't lead to a war which will engulf the whole Middle East. This is why I feel that American policy, again, cannot be content simply to mark time. There must be some kind of effort to settle the problem of peace between Israel and the Arab states, which, by the way, Qasem, who is not anti-Israeli, has never been anti-Israeli, just as he has refused to break the Baghdad Pact membership for Iraq, with the West, so he has refused to issue anti-Israeli pronouncements. It's conceivable that with Qasem in the picture, some kind of peace can be arranged. And if that happens, it's then conceivable that uh, there can be large-scale economic aid to the Middle East with Western technicians taking their place, perhaps alongside of Russian technicians. No reason why both shouldn't be there under United Nations auspices. So that we can make sure that uh, in the struggle to get at the oil resources of these oil-rich countries, the result isn't a war. Now, I want to devote the rest of my time to uh, an analysis of some of the things that I asked you to read about America itself, uh, talking a little about the picture in the American culture and a little about the, the subculture of uh, Jewish life in America. To refresh your recollection, I asked you to read a little about uh, place in America, about the small town and the city and the suburb, about the open class system, about the minority situation, about religion in America, and about education in America. And the logic of that was that 
we were going to talk about modes of life in America, the small town, the city, the suburb, Jewish education and religious experience inside this larger frame. It's a tough kind of assignment because you have to talk about both the larger frame and the smaller frame at the same time. And there are many things, many things that are involved on each of them. And so I'll have to be very brief on each and again leave it to you to raise questions. One of the rather eccentric uh, British sociologists, Patrick Geddes, who was a mentor of Lewis Mumford, from whom Mumford says he learned a good deal, once had a rather interesting formula. He said that you can, you can generally learn a good deal about the quality of any culture by looking at the relationship between three factors in it. Those three factors are one, the people, two, place, and three, work. What he was saying, of course, is that in any culture you have uh, the population itself, the various ethnic strains, and so on, of which it's composed, the human material. And second, you have the environment, the natural environment, within which this human material lives and with which it interacts. And then third, you have uh, what these people do in that environment. Uh, industrialism, capitalism, and so on. Their whole, their whole mode of work, their economic life. And what we're concerned with for a moment now is the second in that formula. We talked last time, you may recall, about the first. About the American people and about the various ethnic groups that have gone into the making of it. We want to talk a little about the second place. It's generally believed, by the way, that Americans do not have much sense of place. There's a certain amount of truth in that. We're restless, mobile people. We move around all the time. It's also generally believed that Jews traditionally have never had much sense of place. They've never really sent down roots. Again, perhaps it's because they have been pushed around a good deal. Not necessarily willingly, as in the case of... Uh, the internal migrations inside the United States. Not always willingly, they've had to move around. And so again, they've never put down roots very much. You get here a rather interesting uh, relationship, a rather interesting congruity, a real relationship between the uh, Americans' uh, larger culture and the Jewish subculture. It may be one reason why uh, Jews have found America so hospitable a place, so, uh, so congenial to their temperament. The mobility of American life is part of their own mobility. And yet, uh, after all, Jewish culture at the very start had put down roots. It was part of uh, first pastoral, then an agricultural society. Uh, it was uh, on its land for a long time. It had a sense of place. All you have to do is to read the Old Testament to get a feeling for that sense of place. And the Jews at various points in the world have tried to put down roots and get a sense of place. In Israel, for example, they have it. One has only to visit the kibbutzim in Israel or the towns to sense that. Uh, how about the United States? I can say quite in a general way that the Jews never found a sense of place in America, either on the farms, which they did not find congenial, as they did in Israel. They did not find it congenial. Nor in the small towns, which they did not find congenial. Nor really even in the cities. Generally, the association of American Jews is with cities. And yet I doubt the congeniality there. At any rate, I would say that with the recent movements from the cities to the suburbs, you find uh, uh, a tendency on the part of the Jewish population to form a very considerable part of that movement to the suburbs. And the putting down of roots in the suburbs uh, does seem to me to have, uh, to have found a real response on the part of the Jewish subculture. What I'm suggesting, of course, is 
that you have here both uh, something characteristic of American life in which Jews are playing a very big role in the movement to the suburbs, and you have here something that is part of the Jewish experience in America, which is of very considerable importance. In the big cities, the Jews were not able to have the sense of community participation in their own ethnic community that they are able to get in the, sub in the suburbs. In the small towns, there were all kinds of isolating factors that, that frightened them away. That isn't true of the suburb. One of the things about the suburb is that you're able to maintain your relationship to the town of which the suburb forms the fringe. You're within striking distance of all kinds of cultural possibilities in it. But at the same time, uh, your friendships, your organizational work, your religious life, uh, and so on, is carried on within the suburb in a compassable way. I want to look a little more closely into that, see how true it is, and look a little more closely into the, the, what has generally been happening for the American, larger American culture here. Uh, a, good deal, a good deal in our present American life is runaway. We have a runaway technology. We have a runaway uh, leisure system now, far more leisure than we know what to do with. We uh, have, in some areas of our life, runaway living standards. We have runaway delinquency in children. There's a runaway quality about, uh, about our mental breakdowns and so on. Similarly, uh, we have the runaway city, or the exploding metropolis, which is the way one recent series of articles that's been put into a book puts it. Uh, this quality in American life of bursting the seams continually has resulted in, uh, in uh, what I would call myself not the city and the suburb separately, but a, a cluster city. That is a city core with metropolitan areas around it and with suburban areas around that. Uh, it has resulted also in uh, a great difference on the American map from what it used to be. You look at the American map now, at least on the eastern coast, and you will find right down from southern Maine to perhaps South Carolina, certainly to North Carolina, a continuous stretch of settlement of city and suburb together, of cluster city. You'll find the same thing on the west coast if you look all the way from Portland, Oregon, or perhaps even Seattle, down to uh, San Diego, the southern end of California. And what this means is that Americans have regrouped themselves, have occupied, occupied some of the unoccupied areas, have, that there's a double movement of population going on. One part of it is a movement away from the small town to the city, which is still going on, the other is a movement from the city to the suburb and the exurbs. Uh, this means that the city population is more or less at a standstill. It's gaining pretty much what it loses. It means that the small towns are decaying. They're decaying in a double sense. They're decaying because their best young people are moving away. There's no attraction in small town life. It's too hickish. There's no glamour in it, there are no opportunities. They're moving to the cities for the same reason that Americans have always moved to the cities, a combination of uh, comfort and glamour and new liberties, particularly sexual liberties, educational opportunity, but mostly, uh, uh, mostly economic opportunity, career opportunity. And that movement is still going on. But in addition to that, there is the second movement, from the cities outward to the suburbs. There is a third one just beginning now from the suburbs back into the cities. Uh, that's, uh, we don't know yet how far that will extend. There's very little, very little uh, from the city back to the small town or the farm, very minimal. Uh, I do want to say a word about the city itself. I happen myself to... Uh, 
to feel that a good deal of the of the criticism in sociological literature about the American city is overdone. I feel myself in affinity with city life. Uh, I, uh, I think this has to do probably with my special work, uh, my special needs, but not entirely. I think it has to do with, uh, with the feeling that one can find one's uh, privacy in the midst of a very large city much more easily than one can find it in the much smaller unit even of a small town or of a suburb. And as I feel that the, the impersonality of the city has merits, the merits of allowing you to carve out your own friendships and your own privacies as well as the access that it offers to all kinds of opportunities. I myself am an example, I suppose, of the historic suction force exerted uh, by the big cities in America for centuries. I recall one of the most moving sentences in recent literature on the city. is a sentence written by E.B. White, which I quote in my book. E.B. White, who, as you know, writes for The New Yorker, who did a piece on New York once for holiday, and who, in the course of uh, talking a little about about the difficulties of living in New York, it's the scars in it, the more scabrous aspects of it, then went on to say, nevertheless, nevertheless, this city, this mischievous and marvelous monument, which not to look upon would be like death. And I must say, when I think of that sentence, this mischievous and marvelous monument, which not to look upon would be like death. I think you have distilled there in a single sentence not just the, the attraction power of New York itself, but of every great city, of every cosmopolitan city, of every great metropolis, which is both a mischievous and a marvelous monument, the suburb. I think the suburb was possible because the revolution, the revolution in transport in American life. Burst the bounds of the city. It was the automobile which first made the suburb possible. But that the same revolution, the same transport revolution, meant that the recoil against the city did not mean the abandonment of the city. And what you have in suburban life is the effort to live in both worlds as well, as at the same time. At least the feeling that you can always get into both worlds and that you don't have to accept the pathology of city life, that you can get your children out of the neighborhoods that are dangerous, that you can get them out of the districts where the school system has decayed, that you can give them uh, a better mode of life. A good many of the moves to suburbs have been made in those terms. I would myself say that there is now a, in, among sociological commentators on American life a tendency to dismiss the suburb and the suburban way of life with contempt. It is one of the forms of condescension that you find among American intellectuals who are among the most condescending of all uh, intellectual elite groups in the world. Uh, the tendency to give themselves a feeling of superiority by condemning almost everything in American life except their own little narrow interests and their own little narrow circle. Uh, I don't find necessarily that my tastes must be imposed on others. I can uh, understand and accept the fact that the suburbs do seem to meet certain deep needs of people, needs for a particular physical way of life, for a particular neighborhood way of life, for uh, clustering together, for, uh, for finding a compassable group in a, in a compassable neighborhood. I can understand all that. I can understand that the impersonality of the city is frightening and that the suburb gives you some of the personality of the small town. By the way, the small town in America has generally been viewed by intellectuals with a good deal of warmth. There's always a nostalgia for the small town because the small town was the place where you were born or where your father was born before 
before he moved away. It was the it was part of nostalgic, idyllic, rural America, which is not true of the suburbs. The suburbs are something very different. They're part of, uh, of new, impersonal, depersonalized America. And yet the suburb, as I say, does offer some of the things the small town offered and some other things as well. To me, by the way, the best picture of small town life is to be found, let's say, in the short stories and novels of Sherwood Anderson or in the poetry of Edgar Lee Masters where you get the cruelty and intolerance and the aridity of small town life along with all the nostalgic qualities that uh, some of the other writers have celebrated. Now you do get in the suburb what we call the face-to-face -face relationships. That is you, you meet people, you know people when you meet them on the main street. You get that in the small town. In fact, one of the best ways of distinguishing between a small town and a city is that in the small, in the city, when you run into someone you know, you get a shock of surprise. In the small town, when you run into someone you don't know, you get a shock of surprise. It's one way to tell which is which. In the suburb, the tendency is, of course, uh, to be like the small town. There's a good deal of, uh, of brotherhood in it. In fact, uh, Bill White, who wrote a very interesting study of the suburban way of life in that book of his, The Organization Man, which is also about other things, but partly about suburbs, he points out that uh, in the suburb people have so much brotherhood that they are imprisoned in brotherhood, <laughs> that they, they can't get away from it. It becomes, uh, becomes part of them willy-nilly, whether they like it or not. Well, I'm su suggesting now that for all these aspects of suburban life, there seems to be some kind of congruity with uh, Jewish aspirations in America, with the Jewish mood. The Jews, incidentally, form part of the middle class, which is uh, chiefly the class that has been migrating to the suburbs. They form part of the living standards. It is their living standards that are chiefly the living standards that are to a great extent the living standards of that class. And the problem of ghettoization, the problem of, of making some kind of compromise or coming to terms with the two demands of American life, the demand to be with those of your own uh, ethnic group and at the same time the demand to belong to the larger culture, that this problem seems somehow to be solved by the suburb. At least I think it can be solved by the suburb. The big city tends toward ghettoization in a different sense. A little cluster of a particularly particular ethnic group in, in the larger city. That is not true to the same extent of the suburb. My own feeling about, uh, about the suburb is that mostly it's a flight from loneliness and temporariness. I think this is what most Americans are suffering from feeling of being lonely in a mass culture, the feeling of living a very temporary kind of life in a culture which is always in flux. And so there's a flight from this toward putting down roots and getting away from temporariness, toward finding neighbors and club members and so on and getting away from loneliness. I don't think they ever really get away entirely. You carry yourself with you no matter where you go. And if, uh, if you are the kind of person who, who tends to be completely conformist, you will be conformist whether you're in a city or a suburb or a small town. My own feeling is that the whole problem of conformism cuts across place, as indeed I think it cuts across class. I think it's part of the American general trends of the American personality and of American culture now, and that it has to do with identity. And again, I would say that the wrestling with the question of identity is something that you have to face no matter where you are. You have to find out who you are. You have to find it out whether you're in a, on a farm or in a small town or in a big city or in a suburb or out in exurbia, which means farther away than the suburb is from the city. You've got to face that. 
And in every area of American place, there are defects. I would say that the great defect of individualism is isolation, and many of us feel isolated in an individualistic society. And then we try to recoil against that toward communal living, but then there is a defect of communal living, which is standardization and conformity. I don't think that there are any, there are any cultural solutions here. The solutions have to be fought out within the individual personality. I think that there can be directions, there can be guidelines from cultural leaders. I think that the, the people who are the value creators in a society, and this includes partly the intellectuals, can do something about that. But I don't think that the question of the environment, the question of the kind of place you live in, is determining. And now I move on. Uh, to some of the other things which I want to deal with more briefly. Uh, for example, the problem of class in America. We're going to deal next month more uh, in detail with the whole question of the American class structure and where the Jewish American community fits into that. Here for today, I ask you to read only one section of that chapter, which was on the open class system. I asked you to read that because you cannot really talk about the minority situation or about religious life or education in the minority groups without understanding well, the nature of the open class system in America. Now, what do we mean by the open class system? We talk a good deal about America as a classless society, just as the communists talk about communism as a classless society. May I say that I don't believe either of them exists. I don't think there's a classless society either in the Marxist world or in the world of the chambers of commerce here. Uh, you do not have a classless society in the sense that people are judged only as individuals. Obviously, they find their place in the society partly because of their economic ranking, partly because of their status, their prestige ranking, because of the house they have, or the clothes they wear, or the automobile they have, because of uh, what their living standard is, because of how much they earn, because of what their color is, because of what their inheritance is, and so on. You have a class system. What then do we mean by an open class system? What we mean is that the class system exists, but that it is possible to move from one class to another without too much hindrance. And in that sense, America is an open class society. Class divisions are there, but they're not insurmountable. Now, they tend to be a little rigid, especially up at the top, they're rigid. It's very hard to break your way into the very top class. Professor C. Wright Mills, who has done a brilliant book on the power elite, with which I have some quarrels, but no question at all about its analytical brilliance. Professor C. Wright Mills suggests and that what we have up on top of the class system is, uh, is several elites, a number of elites which combine because all of them form part of the same web of power. They're the power elite, a business elite, a governmental elite, a military elite. I want to talk about that more next month. Nevertheless, I would say that it's possible to get even into those elites, hard but possible and that the movement from the, from the uh, low classes, from the worker classes into the middle class, from the lower middle class into the upper middle class, and from the upper middle class into certainly the, well, what Warner calls the lower upper class, that is the class into which you can move by wealth alone, that's quite possible. Actually, if I may say just a word about the Jewish experience in America in these terms, I don't suppose the Jews ever in all their wanderings in the diaspora have struck a class situation quite like the American open class system. The closest they came to it was in England, where for a time they had to live under a number of legal restrictions until the middle of the 19th century when the legal restrictions were removed. In some respects, the British situation and the French situation are better than the American in one or two respects. 
For example, it was possible in both England and in France for a Jew to be the uh, head of state. Thus far in the whole American political experience, that has not been possible. You remember in England, Disraeli was prime minister. In France, Leon Blum was prime minister. In America, that still has not happened. Uh, there are one or two other respects in which this is the same thing would be true, and yet, on the whole, I think there's no question that the British class system and the French class system are more rigid than the American. It would still be true that the Jews have never in their whole diaspora experience encountered anything like the open class system in America, which is another and perhaps even stronger reason for what I call the congruity of the uh, Jewish spirit with the American social system. I talked of it a while ago with respect to a sense of place and mobility. Here I'm talking of the open class system. What the Jews were able to get here, just the way, just what other ethnic groups have been able to get here, what groups of, from coming from every culture in the world, was a career open to talent, at least largely open, at least to most talent. Notice you have to make restrictions all along. The worst restrictions were with respect to the Negroes. There are still very serious restrictions with respect to Mexican Americans and Spanish Americans, with respect, with respect to Puerto Ricans. Those are still very serious. But they too are being whittled away. And as far as the Jew is concerned, he had to fight some very sharp battles of discrimination, but in many of them uh, he has won out. But with, with, on the score of living standards, of achieving a position within the economy and within living standards, all you have to do is to move around the country, as I've done for the last 20 or 25 years, community after community, to see that the Jews have become part of American prosperity and of this open class system and have made a place for themselves in it. It's never quite as high as it would be with respect to any individual or family if that individual or family were not Jewish. There's always a kind of subtraction involved because of it, or there is always a little extra effort, extra energy, extra ambitiousness that's called for. And yet, uh, the obstacles have yielded to pressures when the pressures were applied. Now, I think that the arena of struggle has changed now. I think that the meaningful arena of struggle is no longer within the class system or even within the economic system. I think that it has been transferred. It has been transferred inside of the psyche, inside of the mind. The problems have become problems of inner security, of psychological security. They become problems of values and direction and identity, as I've suggested before. Problems have arisen having to have arisen also having to do with the identity of the group. For example, the problems of intermarriage, which trouble Jews a good deal today. Uh, problems of religious education that trouble them a good deal. Problems of the use of the public schools for religious indoctrination, which trouble them a good deal. And to that, finally, uh, I want to turn very briefly for maybe five minutes, and then we can have some questions. I obviously should devote a good deal more time to each one of these aspects, but there are many things I wanted to do. Uh, the Jews are part of what I call the minority situation in America. By the way, I've been severely criticized in one or two Jewish publications in the United States for not dealing at greater length in my book on American civilization with the Jews as a group in American life. I neither have I dealt with other ethnic groups as groups except for one. I've dealt, I've singled out only one, the Negroes. 
I've singled them out for a very particular reason, because it seemed to me that as of now, as of the mid-1950s, the struggle for civil rights for Negroes is the most fateful struggle for America as a whole. I have not dealt with the role of Catholics and Catholicism in American life, or the role of Jews and Judaism, or the roles of role of the of the Mexican and Spanish and Puerto Rican Americans and so on, because each one of those would have involved a very considerable expenditure of space and energy. I may have been wrong, but at any rate, uh, I try to make up for it in some of the things that uh, that are involved in this course. Now, I do point out, of course, as one must point out in any discussion of America, that America was made up of immigrant groups and that there has recently been a change in the attitude of the children of these immigrants. There is a recoil from the idea of assimilation, assimilation in the meaning of the complete submergence of the ethnic group within the larger culture. And instead of assimilation, we are now talking of integration with the larger culture, where the identity of the ethnic group remains, uh, remains untouched. It was Marcus Henson, a great American historian of immigration, who pointed out that it's the third generation in American life which marks this change. The first generation struggles with the new environment. The second generation is ashamed of its father's but the third generation, the third generation reasserts its uh, link with its own ethnic group. I think that's happening now, this reassertion. It brings with it a new kind of pride, a new quality of, uh, of assertiveness on the part of the members of these eth ethnic groups. But there still remains something on which we touched in the questions last month, but we didn't get a chance to do very much with it. There still remains the question of the danger to the identity of the group. I find as I read uh, Jewish language newspapers, periodicals, I can't read Hebrew, but I can read Yiddish, fortunately, so that I can keep in touch somewhat with that. I find a good deal of, of anxiety about intermarriage. One study that I reported on in my book was a study made in New Haven, a Kennedy study, a study of intermarriage over a period of time, which indicated some rather interesting results. And that is that there's been a tendency to wipe out uh, the national divisions, but uh, we still stick very much to religious divisions. That is, today in New, that is to say, in New Haven, you will find that more and more, uh, let's say, Italians and Irish and Poles intermarried, but that the intermarriage of Catholics and Protestants or the intermarriage of Jews and Gentiles still remain banned. And that's probably still true. The study is about 10 years old. But I would say that in the last decade, this tendency has not been diminished. So that what you get is a wiping out of certain kinds of distinctions, the national distinctions, but uh, a, a, a retention, perhaps even a sharpening, of the religious ones. You have to ask why. I think certainly in the case of Jews, it is tied up with the whole experience of persecution particularly under the Nazis, the feeling that what Hitler was aiming at was the wiping out of Jewish identity in the world as such, and of course it was true. It may well be what uh, some Arab leader may aim at with respect to Israel, but in uh, reaction to that, there is a very understandable feeling that one of the one of the tests of commitment to membership in the Jewish community is the test of whether you uh, are willing to uh, allow the, the uh, continuity to be broken, the, the strain of heredity to be diluted by intermarriage. Obviously what intermarriage does uh, as the generations go on is to make the dilution greater 
so that eventually the fear is the sense of identity as Jews vanishes entirely. And then what happens to Jewish life as such in the world? This is a puzzling problem. It's a difficult problem for which there can be no, no terribly clear answers. I can only say that on this score, on this score, I think this uh, ban, this, this, this taboo on intermarriage will meet uh, a very real obstacle in the spirit of American culture as a whole. That is, there is, here there is not a congruity between this tendency, the part of many Jews, and the spirit of American life. There's an incongruity. Because one of the things about American dynamism that I found at the end of my study, in fact, all the way through my study, is that this dynamism knows no boundaries. It breaks down all obstacles. One of the things that I was convinced of when I did a little studying of the American physical type is that a new physical type will emerge over the generations, that the physical differences that now exist will tend to be blurred and to diminish. Because intermarriage is going on throughout American life. It goes on even uh, across the color line. It certainly goes on across uh, the lines, the boundaries of national origin, ethnic origin, and it goes on and it is bound to go on across the religious boundary lines. And there's another problem, of course, and that is the problem of how a minority group can, uh, can uh, assert its, uh, its, its British protest against majority groups' efforts to draw the line between majority and the minority on some scores, and then on other scores insist that a very sharp line has to be drawn. These are the dilemmas, and I present them as dilemmas. I have great respect for those who feel that the problem of maintaining identity is so strong that intermarriage is the great enemy. I respect it. I do not agree with it. And as a student of American life, I would say that it's probably a hopeless fight because the whole trend in the culture as a whole is toward breaking down these boundaries. Now, there are a lot more, a lot more things there that you will want to talk about that I haven't touched on. I just want to say one other thing, and this has to do with uh, religion, that there is an effort on the part of the various religions that make up American life today, of course, again, to maintain, uh, maintain their identity. This is true of Catholicism, it's true of Judaism, it is becoming truer of Protestantism. Uh, there is also a tendency toward conversion, but that's another matter. And yet, despite this effort of each to maintain its identity, what is uh, happening in the American, whole American landscape is the emergence of a three-religion culture. Will Herberg has, is responsible for that phrase, actually he took it over, he says, from this Kennedy study that I speak of. A three-religion culture, that is a culture in which we no longer think of America as a Protestant country with two religious uh, uh, minority denominations, but as a three-religion culture with a kind of equality for all three religions. My university at Brandeis has tried to give expression to that symbolically in the form of the three chapels that you know about. Here in New York, it's given expression to, as it is in other cities, by the makeup of the political campaign tickets, which give a kind of balancing of the various religions. Uh, there's a tendency uh, in the part of a good deal of popular thinking in this direction. And it raises some very serious problems, some problems that Mr. Herberg has raised in his book, namely, that if you get this kind of uh, a feeling that, uh, that all these religions are equal, you may get another feeling, and that is that really there are no basic differences between them. There are no basic differences between them, he suggests, don't you get a dilution of religious feeling? Doesn't religious feeling depend upon the maintenance of a sharpness of, uh, of demarcation between the religions? Not necessarily a bigotry, an intolerance, religious struggle, but at least of a sharpness of identification and commitment. 
Certainly there's a tendency toward the maintenance of the sharpness in the growth, recent growth of parochial education, not only on the part of the Catholic groups and to some extent of the Protestant groups, but also of the Jewish groups. And this too raises again the question that I've been coming back to in the last few minutes continually, and that is, in what way can this be squared with the tendencies in the rest of American life toward the leveling of differences rather than the maintenance of differences? My own feeling is that at least for a time, this tendency toward the maintenance of the identity of the group, unless it's carried to a self-destructive uh, point, but this tendency is a healthy one because it can be linked with the retention of a feeling of the identity of the individual. The threats to the individual identity in this mass culture are very great. And there are many who cannot bear these threats, who cannot carry them, cannot carry the burden of them alone. They find that it is difficult for them to dissociate themselves from the rest of the culture unless they can do it as part of a compassable group of others like them with a similar origin, with a similar tradition, with a similar history, with a similar set of symbols, with a similar set of historic experiences and tragedies, with a similar set of martyrdoms and martyr heroes and so on. Because this is what's happening. In other words, I would suggest that one of the things that is helping to shape the attitudes of the Jews as a minority group in America is not only its memory of the whole Hitler experience, but partly also its effort to fight the the depersonalizing forces in American life as a whole. This may be true for other groups too, and it may be that at least temporarily, one of the things that will save individual identity during this transition period is the effort of the individual to maintain a kind of temporary fortress with other like-minded people. But ultimately, as I suggested before, the individual cannot find security in any kind of fortress whether it be uh, the majority culture or the minority culture. Eventually, ultimately, the individual has to find his identity within himself and his fortress within himself. All right, that's it. And now we're going to spend the rest of the time on questions on many or all of us. We're just going to give a few people who want to leave now a chance to leave, and then we'll go on with questions. I think our best bet is to take it one section at a time. This section here. Ordinarily, Mr. Freeman collects questions. I guess if you want to write them, we can still arrange to for me to read them. Uh, I don't know what the machinery is. Uh, but if you have cards there and want to write your questions, please do, and I'll take them. Meanwhile, I'll take oral questions one second at a time. On my left. All right, that's later. You find what book alarming? Yes. Lady says she finds the book I mentioned by Drew Pearson, America, Second Class Power, with a question mark quite alarming. Would I recommend it? Yes, I recommend it because I think that the material that Pearson has gathered there is factual material. The conclusions uh, seem to be fairly clear, and that is that if the tendencies that have gone on during the past, uh, during the past six or seven years continue, America will become a second-class power in certain respects. Now, you say, do I recommend it? I recommend it for its factual material. If you say, do I agree with it, there are disagreements I have with its premises. I want to be very sharp on this. I do not believe that America's ultimate place in the world is going to depend on how we do in the missile race, for example or what happens on atomic airplanes, or even what happens on atomic submarines where we've done pretty well. 
My own conviction, as I've expressed it repeatedly, is that both sides now have enough weapons, lethal weapons, to destroy each other and themselves. Now, why then do I refer to this book at all and the theme? Notice I referred to it as a symbolic thing. I said that Sputnik indicated to many Americans that we had fallen behind. On this thing, the falling behind is symbolic of the vacuum of leadership. To me, however, the more important expressions of that absence of leadership lie not so much in the weapons race, which is what Drew Pearson is mostly concerned with, but in other areas of American policy and power. For example, the same thing is true in our foreign policy. It's true in, in our position today in the Far East because of our China policy and our position in the Middle East because of our Middle East policy. It may turn out to be true of our position in Latin America and in Africa. Now, secondly, uh, what counts to me is not the results of the weapons race, but the indication you get in Pearson's book that we have not used the scientific and technological and intellectual talent that we have at our command well in that race. Just as we have not used our talent well in, uh, in diplomacy, just as we have not used it well in the, on the whole educational front. You see what I mean when I say it's symbolic? Take, for example, Rickover as an example. Rickover is a triumphant figure to me because uh, he was able on one small segment of the weapons race. You can speak of a segment of a race. One small segment of that whole, that whole front. Uh, he was able to do something on atomic submarines. Now, he did it despite the bureaucracy. He dis did it despite the lack of leadership. He did it despite red tape. He did it despite smugness and self-sufficiency and lethargy. He did it because of his, uh, his talent and the fire burning in his belly. Uh, uh, there may be other people who, if we had more rickovers, could have been organized so that their talents could be used. And while I would prefer to have their talents used in other ways than in the weapons race, our failure there indicates a similar failure elsewhere. That's why the Pearson book is so important to me. All right, in this row. Yes, this gentleman. Well, let me say, first of all, that as most politicians go, he's a relatively well-educated young man. Uh, he, uh, he's an Ivy League product. He did graduate work. He's, uh, he's a kind of egghead. He has tried not to, uh, not to thrust it forward too much, but certainly he's one of the intellectuals in the Senate. Uh, he has ability, he has talent. What experience he has, he's still a very young man. He has so far talked about, mostly about only two phases of foreign policy. One has to do with the Algerian struggle, the other was an attack on the administration on this question of the of the lag in, uh, in the weapons race. I do not find in him any distinctive qualities of mind and leadership, I will confess. I find in him mainly an alert and bright young man who wants to be president, whose father has a good deal of money and uh, can do something about helping him, uh, for whom there was a fortunate combination of circumstances in the vice presidential race in 1956. Uh, I also have a considerable sympathy with him in the sense that I like to see the usual obstacles uh, of bigotry overcome. And I think that the obstacle of bigotry with respect to a Catholic in America is one of the unnecessary obstacles. I don't think the fact that Kennedy is a Catholic should therefore make us uh, support him necessarily uh, in order to show broad-mindedness broad and so on. But as I say, I have a good deal of, of sympathy with him on that score. Beyond that, I'm afraid I can't go. He seems to me to belong with uh, a number of other candidates. Uh, Governor Minor of, uh, uh, of uh, New Jersey, uh, Governor uh, Williams of Michigan and so on, who are fine young men.
but who do not seem to me to have the stature requisite for the post. Mrs. Roosevelt, who wrote in her memoirs some things about Mr. Kennedy, mentioned one thing in particular that sticks in our minds. She feels rather strongly against him because she feels that when the really big moral issue arose on the question of McCarthyism, and when the senator's home state of Massachusetts was a very, uh, very, very basic part of that whole struggle because McCarthy, uh, as a Catholic, had a considerable amount of Catholic support. And when Kennedy, as a Catholic, could have played an enormous role, an enormous role, if he had taken a, a strong stand. Mrs. Roswell points out that he failed and refused to take such a stand. Uh, that lack of leadership has been, uh, Mr. Kennedy has tried to explain in various ways. He was sick during the period of that time and so on. But someone has pointed out that uh, Mr. Kennedy is the author of a book called Profiles in Courage. They go on to say they wish that he had less profile and more courage. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is, going to, uh, this is going to plague Mr. Kennedy for some time. Yes, that gentleman there. I'm sorry, in addition not to not talking well, I can't hear. Yes, the gentleman is asking me a scientific question which I'm afraid I'm not prepared to answer. He says, what studies are there of intermarriage between Jews and Gentiles and what, is, what have we learned through these studies about what actually happens to the children of such marriages and then to successive generations in what direction do the children move? I'm sure that there are such studies. I'm afraid I have simply not, not done my homework on that. I have not had to write much on intermarriage, and I have not done the studies. I'll try to make up for that defect. Uh, my hunch is, just as a hunch, just as a hunch that the tendency is for the minority group to get submerged. I'm pretty sure that's true. But I'll try to make it up if I can, if I can discover some studies before next time. Anything else? By the way, you will find me in general a most ignorant man on a lot of things. Uh, and uh, I'll have to confess my ignorance on various things, and this is one of them. All right, right here. This is a most interesting question. The, the gentleman says, judging from the election results here, both nationally and in New York, and from the French election results on de Gaulle, he detects as a common denominator a movement in all of Western society toward a matriarchal society. 
a society, in other words, where uh, the, the women rule. Uh, presumably out of a uh, reaction against the rule of women, uh, we are looking for uh, real leaders. Is that it? We are looking for real leaders, hence the role of the leadership personality. The second part of the question is, what does a practicing liberal do? Does he, uh, does he try to uh, fight this trend and uh, get people to respond to intellectual rather than emotional appeals? Or does he go along with the trend and uh, try to use it for his own liberal purposes? Now, well, let's see. In the first place, may I say that I'm almost bowled over by the idea uh, that from these uh, three election results, you get a matriarchal society. Uh, I think the question of whether we are a matriarchal society here or whether the French are is a question to be discussed in its own right. Uh, you remember Philip Wiley was the one that popularized this in his book, A Generation of Vipers. He spoke of the cult of momism in America, uh, the way in which, uh, in which uh, we are our mother's sons, we cling to them, the, the reverence we pay to, to mom. There's been uh, certainly considerable evidence that the, uh, uh, of possessive American mothers uh, there's some evidence of women uh, wearing the trousers in particular families. Certainly women are outliving men in America, and as they outlive men, they tend to, uh, to have a good deal of property in their name. They own a lot of real estate. They have a lot of the purchasing power and so on. These are things which I had hoped to discuss at some future session, but you brought it up, and uh, uh, I think there is this kind of evidence. But I must say, I, I don't detect yet what foreigners like to say about American life, that we're a matriarchate. Uh, I, would say that, uh, I would say that there are tendencies within the American family to some extent for the uh, dominant woman and the rather weak male, just as in Europe there were tendencies for the patriarch, the dominant male, and the rather, uh, the rather accepting woman. Uh, but I, I certainly I don't find this as uh, pronounced as some others do, and I'll try to explain it another time. Nor do I see any relationship between that and uh, what you call the cult of personality. I would say that the question of leadership in politics has to do with the bewildering aspects of our world, feeling of things taking place all around us, that partly we don't understand and need someone to explain to us, and partly we feel we can't affect. They're too technical, too complex. They have to do with foreign policy, which is not within our grasp, and so on. The feeling of leadership, uh, the need for leadership comes out of that. The hunger for leadership comes out of that. The complexity, the technical aspect, the bewildering feeling that we have about our world. And partly also it comes out of our own uprootedness, uh, one way of getting roots is to attach yourself to some kind of leader symbol. Now, uh, this is true of America, it's true of France, it's true of various parts of the world. May I say it has been true long before democracy. Real leadership, real leadership uh, politics is uh, pre-democratic politics. It's also non-democratic politics, totalitarian politics. Now, I think one of the mistakes, if I may suggest it, that this gentleman makes is to believe that there's something incompatible between uh, the functioning of a democracy and the functioning of leadership. I once did in uh, my very first book, It Is Later Than You Think, I did a chapter in which I protested against the feeling of liberals that you must not allow power to be concentrated in the, in the government, hands of the government. I pointed out that wherever you don't concentrate power, you can't do anything effective and that it was the lack of effectiveness, the, the collapse of the German economy, the paralysis of the German political system, which led to the German hysteria and which led to Nazism, that wherever you don't have effective parliamentary government, you get dictatorial government. I wrote a chapter called Power is What You Make It. Now, similarly, I feel that way about... I think his instincts are right, his political views are right, his commitments are right, 
And I do not believe that he was elected out of emotionalism any more than I think that the American uh, election results come out of emotionalism. I think there's another problem involved, which I wrote about a good deal during the campaign. That has to do with the public relations techniques of dressing up a personality so that it becomes a synthetic leader symbol rather than an actual one. That's a very different problem. And I think this is one of the reasons why we got mistaken about Eisenhower. He was dressed up as a leader symbol that he was not. The 1952 elections were the triumph of this kind of selling job. One of the things that I think, hope that all of us will do is to try to educate the people to see the difference between synthetic leadership and genuine leadership, between the fake and the authentic. But the strong leadership has to be there. And that's why uh, I don't recognize your dilemma. You say, what shall we do in politics, the intellectual or the emotional? May I say, sir, that I don't understand this. It's like saying to me, uh, how are you going to live your life, emotionally or intellectually? I live my life both ways. Can't help it. I don't want to help it. If I ever tried to live my life only intellectually, I'd find myself very quickly in a mental breakdown. If I try to live my life only emotionally, I'd find myself very quickly either in a prison or in a mental institution. You can't do it either way, only one way. You've got to do it both ways. Because the, but the whole body-mind uh, dichotomy, by the way, is an unreal one. It's all part of each other. And I feel the same way about politics. This is why when I was talking a while ago about the elections, I said that the, that they were, the results were a response to very deeply felt beliefs, understandings, passions, and everything else. And I want this to be so. I, I'm glad to have it so. I'm glad that a, a human personality functions as a whole, both in the political process and elsewhere. But obviously, you don't want to buy the synthetic thing. You don't want to be misled by a fake. And as a practicing liberal or as a practicing decent conservative, whatever it may be, I hope whatever educational efforts we make are directed toward distinguishing between the fake and the authentic. All right, is there something else? I think on this side again, this lady, yes? Can we have a little quiet because I can't hear well as I told you? One thing about Why do I think he was quite what? Why do I think he was defeated last night? The question is, what do I think of what do I think of Adlai Stevenson? Why was he defeated when he ran twice? What do I think of his stature? I think very well of Adlai Stevenson. I voted for him both times. I suppose I'd vote for him again if he got nominated again. Uh, may I say that so far, I've looked through the whole bunch of both Republicans and Democratic candidates, and. Uh, I think I've said a number of times, maybe to you too, let me repeat it here, they all look like vice presidential stuff to me. <laughs> not presidential, not presidential. Uh, the only one that looks presidential to me is Stevenson. And I'm talking now, I'm talking now of, uh, I'm talking now of maturity, of perspective, of understanding. I think where perhaps Stevenson is weak, he lacks what the great German sociologist Max Weber called the charisma of leadership, the halo, you know, the, the feeling. Remember, there, there's two types of leadership. There's the charismatic leader, and then there is the sort of the professional political leader. The charismatic leader is one about whom you feel an extraordinary quality so that you feel enormously attracted to him emotionally. De Gaulle has this charisma. He's a wretched speaker, by the way. It's not from speaking. He's a wretched speaker. He's a gawky, uh, unlikely looking fellow. He's made all kinds of mistakes. And yet, not only the French, but we too feel about him this sense of the extraordinary, sense of sort of a distance between, between the ordinary voter and himself. He has uh, he's helped that feeling very much, of course, by, by the way in which he has taken himself. 
He takes himself with the seriousness of somebody that sees his role in history as a whole, takes himself as part of the great historic process. He almost talks of himself in the third person. There's a grand style, both in his writing as there is in his speaking and in his personality. Now, Stevenson lacks some of this grand style. Roosevelt had it. To an amazing degree, he had it. He was able both to give you the feeling of intimacy and of being a very ordinary fellow with you, and yet also the feeling of being set very much apart from you. And Stevenson somehow does not communicate the contagion, either on the score of intimacy or on the score of the grand style. And this may be one reason why he lost the election. He did not communicate the contagion. I think he lacks a good deal of self-assurance. I think he has not resolved some perhaps basic emotional problems within himself. He is in that sense, I think, intellectually very mature. Emotionally, he may not be very mature. I don't know enough about his emotional life, but that would be my guess. But at any rate, he does not communicate that sense of sureness which people demand of a leader. You remember that wonderful passage, those wonderful passages in Tolstoy's novel, War and Peace. These are the passages at the beginning of each book in which Tolstoy talks about history. He's talking about the military campaign of Napoleon against the Russians. And it's General Kutuzov, who was the head of the Russian forces, who's talking there. And Kutuzov says, now look, really, we didn't know anything about what we were doing in military terms. We had not any notion at all. But we didn't dare let the soldiers know. So far as the soldiers were concerned, the whole role of a general was to look as if he knew the whole plan of campaign and exactly where everyone fitted into it and exactly what was happening. Now, there's a deep truth in that. And not only a military leader, but a political leader has to give that sense of assurance, which again Roosevelt had, which de Gaulle has, which Adenauer has, which, uh, which uh, Khrushchev has which Gandhi has, which Mao Zedong has, which Ben-Gurion has, which a whole series of people have who are in the grand style as leaders. Stevenson doesn't have it. But I still think that if you talk about the guidance of the American nation in the perilous years ahead, on issues which demand a knowledge of, of history and foreign policy and economics and a lot of other things, the, uh, the intellectual capacity to grasp these things, the feeling of perspective so that you can differentiate between the trivial and important, the self-discipline which enables you to hold steadfast in a crisis, the courage which enables you to hold to unpopular choices, even though you know they're unpopular but because you believe they're important, the sense of complexity so that you don't make everything oversimplified as, let's say, Truman has tended to do and so on. These qualities Stevenson has. And I think it would be very tragic if uh, the American people, which has the good fortune at a great crisis in its history to have leadership available of this kind, it would be a great tragedy if they did not uh, make, uh, make use of this availability. All right, uh, this lady here. Uh, I'm afraid we're, we got into a verbal tangle here. The lady says, wouldn't integration, if you really applied it, lead to assimilation? It's a little hard for me to understand that. As we use integration, it is distinguished from assimilation. The assimilation concept is, for example, that a Jew is primarily uh, part of the larger American culture and tries to do away with whatever elements in his own Jewish culture are... Uh, discrepant with that. That's assimilation. 
It means, uh, it means assuming all the outward forms of the larger culture. It's the melting pot concept. You pour something, various things into a melting pot and they all get fused into a single thing. That's assimilation. Integration is the exact opposite. Integration says we will become part of the larger culture, yes, but only in those aspects which do not threaten the identity of our subculture. Where the identity of our subculture is threatened, we maintain that subculture. That's, that's integration. And by very definition, to carry that out does not mean the assimilation and loss of identity. All right, there was another lady over here, yes? Yes. Why, why, why would Stevenson be turned down, asked the lady. I think the big answer is that anyone who has lost twice is very unlikely to be given a third chance. I think that's the big answer. You know, this, this leads me into some reflections for which I don't have real time now, but you will find, for example, in, uh, in the section of my book on, on uh, life goals in America, I speak of various American values, the things that we value most. And one of them, of course, is success. There's a real cult of success and a real fear of failure. The one man who, uh, whom you shrink from as, uh, as you shrink from some dread disease is the man who's been a failure. You're afraid that the failure will be infectious. The man to whom you turn, you cling to him, is the man who's a success. It's not just about men, it's about anything. You walk into a, into a play, for example, which uh, the critics have written rave notices about. You just move into the theater, just as soon as you move into the theater, you, you, you smell the smell of success in that theater. It's all around. Even before you've set your eyes on the play, the smell of success is there. Uh, and, and you're ready to respond to it because you like to be part of a going concern that's successful. You don't want to be part of a failure. Now, this is particularly true of an insecure people, as the Americans are, and particularly uh, people who have been moving on the class ladder, moving up on the class ladder so that they are in a different rung of the ladder from what their fathers or grandfathers were. The result is that they have their positions to make. They're worried about their place, their, their status. And because they're worried, they like to associate with success and so on. Now, this finds its expression in politics. It was in Stevenson's favor on his first nomination. He was a successful candidate as governor of Illinois. He had the smell of success around him. Then he got licked, and then he got nominated a second time. And he got licked again, and you ask, won't this happen a third time? The only thing I've suggested, I think I may have suggested it to you once, is that uh, Stevenson should do something about baseball as a symbol. In baseball, even if you've had two strikes, uh, you're still not out. He should go around the country with a baseball uniform, with a ball and a bat, and remind Americans that there is still a chance. But uh, uh, I'm not sure that this is decisive. Perhaps this may be overcome. And one of the reasons it may be overcome is that if I'm right in my analysis of uh, the decline and fall of the Republicans, if this is due to a disillusionment over Eisenhower, then we may think back to the road not taken. You remember that poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken, Two Roads Diverged in a Wood, that ends up, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. It may well be we took the road more traveled by, but that has made all the difference. We may want to go back to the road not taken. As to the alternative that we rejected at that time, there may be a sense within us of, uh, of, uh, of really going back in order to make up for both a mistake and an injustice. That would work in Stevenson's favor. All right, a few more questions. This lady. Ah, ah. 
I thought this would come. I've been amazed that it hasn't come earlier. The lady says, would I comment about the Dorothy Schiff episode in the last election campaign? I'd be very happy to. Well, happy is a strong word. Uh, maybe I'll be very unhappy to, but I'll, I'll comment anyway. I wrote about this, and let me repeat what I wrote. First, I did not agree with Mrs. Schiff in her change of position, not at all. Obviously, I didn't because I was writing my own columns all the time. I had, I had taken my own position very early in the campaign for Harriman, despite the attractiveness of Mr. Rockefeller and despite my respect for him. I have great respect for him, but I felt that uh, that where Mr. Harriman had made the kind of political record in New York that he had made, that it was bad in every way to throw him out. I thought a record like that should be rewarded. Uh, that was my basic reason. I also was worried about some of the people around Mr. Rockefeller, and I still am. However, I'd made my position clear so that obviously I was happy when the post position coincided with it, and then unhappy when uh, the post position at the last minute changed. Now, uh, the second thing I want to say is uh, I don't know anything about why the change was made other than what Mrs. Schiff said in what she wrote afterward. I have no reason for um, believing that that was not a completely true and frank statement. Uh, third, uh, this gave me a chance in my column and it gives me a chance now to underscore the relationship that a columnist has to a newspaper, which is happily one of independence. That is to say, they don't interfere with me in any position I take or anything I write, not even to change of a word or uh, even a comma. They let me run my own little private domain in that column, and uh, equally, uh, I don't interfere with what they do uh, editorially, what the publisher or editor does. I may, I may have particular reactions, as I had in this case, but uh, obviously I don't interfere. And uh, I think that's as it should be. I think, by the way, it's uh, one of the things about the American press, which is one of the best things about it, is that its ownership does not determine uh, everything that happens in every part of a newspaper. The existence of columnists, to that extent, is a break in the ownership power pattern. It's, I think it's a very healthy thing to get diversity, as you get in a number of American newspapers. Often, in many of them, almost the only oasis there is in what is otherwise an intellectual desert in the newspaper is a few columnists here or there who represent a certain amount of sanity. Otherwise, uh, otherwise there isn't much. Now, uh, that isn't true of, uh, of the Post, which is a, a sea of sanity. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I happen to run my own little island within it. Does that answer your question? All right. Now, uh, just a few more, and then we're through. Yes, this lady. Inability of people to what? I see. Uh, the question is whether the flight to the suburbs may not be partly the result of people's inability to free themselves from certain prejudices. For example, in the case of New York, isn't it due to their desire to get away from Negroes and Puerto Ricans? I suppose this is partly true, yes. Uh, the, the, one of the things about the suburbs is that since they are to a great extent synthetic products, in many cases they are the result of so-called developments. Many other cases, there are all kinds of zoning restrictions and so on. Uh, but because of this and because these developments are able to a great extent to control people that buy houses there, the suburb uh, offers uh, fewer of the problems of, of ethnic conflict, ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic uh, contact that the cities do. I don't know to what extent this, how, how strong this motivation is in the flight to the suburbs, the movement to the suburbs, but I'm sure it plays part of the role. I don't think the dominant role. I think the dominant role, as I said before, is the effort to live in both universes and the way in which the transport revolution has made this possible. 
there's one factor that I did not put in that I should have put in, and that is, I think, a very real desire on the part of many Americans for some form of home ownership, which uh, is, becomes less and less possible in the cities. It was possible on the farms and in the small towns. It was possible for a while in the cities. But the nature of, uh, of real estate values in cities made it less and less possible. But the assertion of, of the impulse toward home ownership, feeling not only that your children have a little bit of uh, plot to run around in, but also that this is something that's yours. That, I think, is strong. And one of the reasons for it, of course, is that there's less and less that is ours in property terms in America. The whole transformation, the whole revolution of property in America obviously is one that has moved away from small enterprise to big enterprise. The ownership that we have now is the symbolic ownership of stocks, let's say, in, uh, in various corporations, but that gives you a very different kind of satisfaction from the satisfaction of actual uh, ownership of a piece of land and some real estate. And I think that's part of it, too. It's, uh, it's a way of, of finding roots. It's a way of feeling that you have stature. It's a way of feeling that you belong. It's a way of feeling that you're part of something enduring, and therefore a flight from temporariness and a flight from loneliness. All right, what else? This gentleman. What revolt? The question of the revolt in Sudan and its effect on the Mideast situation. That's a very interesting question because I think that Sudan is not an isolated instance of something that's terribly important in recent uh, foreign affairs. And that is the tendency in a number of countries to turn the government over to the military and to an army leader. Now, the fascinating thing about it is that in many cases in the past where there have been army revolts, they have been efforts on the part of some ambitious leader or of the army as a whole to take over from the civilians, with the civilians caught uh, very unwilling. So far as we can tell, it's different in the Sudan and in other countries. In this case, the civilians were part of the whole thing. They knew it would come. They were quite willing to have it happen. That is, there was a certain amount of collusion between the regime that was overthrown and the army regime that came in. The same thing happened, by the way, in Burma where the civilian UNU was very glad to have the army leader take over. The same thing happened in Pakistan, where the civilian government was glad to have the army take over. Now, why are these things happening? What's their meaning? I have a hunch. I think they're happening wherever there is a very dangerous problem, either of a communist overthrow of the government or of an overthrow by uh, some Nasser group. In the Sudan, there was a very real danger that the Nasserites would gain control. The civilian government, which felt it couldn't resist them, decided that the army would be able to resist much better. In the case of Burma, there was danger that the communists would come in. In the case of Pakistan, I'm not sure of the exact danger, but it was, uh, it was a danger of a general collapse of the government. In other words, what is happening in these, in these cases is that the, the people achieved independence long before they were able to develop either democratic habits or democratic strength or democratic leadership. This, by the way, has been happening all through the world. It's the result of this movement of revolutionary nationalism. I haven't had enough chance really to talk about it, but for a quarter century now, there has been a sort of three-pronged revolution around the world, a movement of revolutionary nationalism, a racial revolution against the whites, and an economic revolution against the big landowners. Uh, the biggest element of these, this three-pronged revolution recently has been revolutionary nationalism. And in any number of situations, there has been a successful effort to overthrow an established imperialist government uh, and uh, to put up a new one before people were ready to do anything. I think the case of Algeria is a very good instance. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that I'm against, I'm against nationalist freedom. 
It does mean that we, all of us, all through the world, have to face the consequences of these premature revolutions. And one of the consequences is that you simply cannot get a government strong enough or experienced enough or wise enough or an electorate with enough education and enough, enough discipline and, and knowledge to maintain democracy. And where that happens, who moves in? Either the communists or the Nasserites or someone comparable. Now, I think this new crop of army dictatorships is an effort to hold the fort, in a sense, against Nasserism and communism during a transition period long enough so that the situation can be stabilized. I think that was true in the Sudan and these other instances that I speak of, and that's why I myself have not been worried at their taking place. Actually, I've had a, a feeling of relief that the, that the situation didn't get worse. The alternatives might have been a good deal worse. Now, uh, I like that question so well that I'd like to call it the last one and end up with just a few sentences about it. Uh, I think that we in the democracies, particularly in America, have a curious feeling as we look at the world. It's the feeling that feeling of strangeness. Why, why, why aren't other peoples uh, democratic the way we are? Uh, the feeling of uh, 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 surely, surely, uh, 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 there must be something perverse about them if they don't adopt the obvious advantages, what we have found to be advantageous. This is a kind of moral imperialism, I call it, of trying to impose our own ideas on other peoples. We do the same thing with capitalism. We say, why, why aren't these various countries, why don't they have capitalism? They should know the merits. Because the answer on capitalism is they haven't got capital. You can't have capitalism unless you have capital, and one way to get capitalism is, uh, capital is through socialism. And my hunch is that the various countries will have to move first through socialism before they can develop a mixed system such as we are moving toward. But now on the democracy, you can't have democracy unless there are other things that have developed in your society. And I like to make the suggestion. When I studied, when I did my book, I had to make a, a five-level study, really. One level was technology. The second was the economy. Technology is industrialism with us. The economy is, is partly capitalist, partly, partly governmental ownership and control. The third level is, uh, is uh, political. Our own political level is uh, constitutional, liberal uh, democracy. Uh, the fourth level is social. That is, there are certain uh, elements of society too, the family, the school, religion, and so on. We are a very modern, mobile, changeable society, which is revolting inwardly at a very rapid rate, changing all the time, very rapidly. And the fifth level is the culture. We are a mass culture that has moved away from individualism, but we still have strong individualist elements in it. Now, our democracy is part of all the rest of it. And it's very hard to expect our democratic political institutions within systems which are very different from us on these other scores. Take Sudan. Technologically, the Sudan is very primitive. Mostly its wealth is in cattle. It's got billions of dollars worth of cattle, but they're used for sort of symbolic purposes in marriage and various religious rituals and so on. It's not got industrialism yet. Economically, obviously, it is still a tribal economy. It has not begun to move either toward capitalism or socialism. Governmentally, therefore, uh, how can you expect it to be democratic? Social, socially, it is still a traditional society, a society in which the tribe dominates, in which the position of woman is very traditional. She has not had any kind of liberation, in which she is sold in marriage for cattle, where the society is that primitive, how can you expect a democracy? And uh, culturally, it is not a mass society. In fact, it hasn't even begun to be an individualist society. It hasn't begun to be where we were hundreds of years ago. Now, where you have a system which on all these other levels is what it is, then it's going to take a long time before it can develop to an extent where it can become a real democracy. 
And we Americans, and particularly we liberals, had better get out of the habit of expecting almost overnight that the world is going to move toward the kind of democracies that we like and want. It won't. It'll take generations and perhaps centuries before various parts of the world can develop the kind of thing that we regard as ideal. Meanwhile, they'll have to develop whatever it is that they can live with and work within. The only thing that we can expect is that they won't make war, that they won't use the atom bomb, that they won't try to annihilate the world, that there won't be a, a, an effort to sort of break out in a kind of madhouse. We don't want aggression. We don't want Nasserism. We don't want Hitlerism. We don't want aggressive communism. We don't want any of these things. But we can live in a world which has all kinds of economic and political and social and cultural forms provided that there is some kind of internal order within that world. And that internal order, of course, has to do with the United Nations and the creation of some kind of core discipline group there which can keep the order. Now, if we change our picture of a desirable world and make it more realistic and understand how long it takes for these countries to move and understand also that they can't begin to move that way unless they do it with our economic help, with our technical aid, with our sympathetic understanding and so on, then we won't be as impatient as we are, we won't expect miracles, and we won't be disillusioned when the miracles don't occur. Now, uh, I want to just suggest to you for the reading for next time, we meet again on January the 20th. It's our third meeting. The reading says the Jews in the frame of American economic life, political life, class system, and legal system. The readings in America as a civilization are chapters 5, 6, and 7. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.